good evening. Welcome to Five Lee's Night School, our second night school on anarchism, uh, both taught by Ruth Kinner. The first one was uh, not online. Uh, hopefully, if we ever do anything similar in future, the, we'll be doing it in person again. There are people here who were at the first course, and there were people here who were who are completely new to this. Um, there are people here who are anarchists. There are people here who are not anarchists. The only thing that uh, the, the only thing I think we can guarantee is that Ruth is an anarchist. At least I hope she is, because she's involved in the anarchist studies uh, group. She as uh, she's in the editorial board of the, the academic journal Anarchist Studies. She's written introductions to any amount of books on anarchism. She's written a Anarchy, a Beginner's Guide. And later this year, she'll be writing an introduction to um, a book that we're reissuing by uh, the late, great Colin Ward. And so the format for the evening, um, it is a night school. Uh, so it's, it's fairly formal. When we're in the bookshop during the night school rather than the usual wine that we have at events. We have tea and biscuits at half time. So I hope you've all brought your tea and biscuits here because we just can't provide them. Um, we talked to Bill Gates and he just said, sorry, it's, it's just not on. Um, maybe in the future. So the format of the evening is Ruth's going to speak for about an hour. Um, please, uh, if you have any questions, put something in uh, the chat uh, or hold your hand up to let us know that you want to say something. Um, I noticed that somebody is saying they're having coffee because property is theft. Proudhon, who said that, um, he also said property is freedom, I think, um, which doesn't quite scan so, so well. Uh, but Proudhon will be mentioned and a whole other pile of people will be mentioned. You've seen the prospectus. You've got the background reading list. Uh, so I hope you all do your homework over the, over the five weeks. Uh, the second part of the meeting, the last half hour, will be a discussion and you will be all visible should you wish to be visible. Uh, you, could, you could just have your screen on or we could see who, who you are. The first half is going to... Um, appear on YouTube later. The discussion will not appear on YouTube later. So in the discussion, you'll be able to say whatever you like, uh, knowing that you're only going to be heard and seen by, heard at least by the people who are here. And uh, you're not being uh, broadcast to the nations. In case you're wondering, the person who's looking over my shoulder is Rudolf Rocker, who was an anarchist. Um, they paint the drawing is by the son Fermin Rocker, and I'm sure uh, Fermin Rocker will be um, mentioned sometime over the course of the, the five weeks. But his book is London Years, uh, where he talked about the pre-war anarchist movement in London, which is published, uh, funnily enough, by Five Leaves Bookshop. <laughs> and if you're not familiar with Five Leaves, um, we have a very good anarchist section, and no doubt Simon will uh who's the other Five Leaves worker there tonight, he's in the background, he'll put up a link so that you could uh, bookmark our anarchist section if you're interested. So please welcome, there he's done it. Um, please welcome Ruth Kinna. Um, I, think, I think there's nothing else I need to do. I'll do, be disappearing. Ruth, I think, is handling the questions herself at the end. I might come back just to say thank you. But... Um, uh, I'll now, like everybody else, have a cookie and a, a cake or something like that for <laughs> Ruth speaking. Okay, thanks very much, Ross. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm just going to um, share my screen. And I'm, I'm going to, as Ross said, I'm going to talk for about an hour or so. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, you'll be able to write questions as I go and um, I'll... I'll um, enjoy the discussion at, at the end of this session. The first thing I want to do today um, is to just say something broadly about the um, the series itself. So there's, there's going to be five sessions in the series. Um, and I suppose the theme is loosely organised around the, uh, the idea of possibility or, or feasibility or, um, if you like, what abolition means. Um, on the on the the thought, I suppose, that um, anarchy is sometimes 
said even by critics to, to sound like a nice idea, but one that's that's not realizable in, in, in practice. So what I want to do is to, first of all, um, address this by thinking about what anarchy as an order means, what that entails, what it is anarchists are saying about order and disorder. Um, the next two sessions look at two different sorts of approaches to um, anarchist alternatives. The first is a is a, um, a discussion of sort of perfectionist ideas of utopia. So we're going to look at two um, anarchist utopias and and think about what the um, the core ideas of those utopias are. And the second um, or the third of the of the, the series is going to look at a, a non perfectionist idea of utopianism. Um, to challenge, if you like, the idea that anarchists are people who only have blueprints. Anarchists do have blueprints as, or as, as, as aspirations, if you like, um, but they don't expect those blueprints necessarily to be realised. So I want to balance the idea of the, the perfect utopia with an approach towards utopianism. So that's going to be the third, um, third um, session. And in the, the, the final two sessions, I want to use these ideas of of anarchy as order and these these approaches to utopia and utopianism to think about two approaches to to so-called abolition one which focuses on the family and looks at uh, the feminist ideas of emma goldman and Voltaire de Clare, um, and the second looks at um, arguments for the abolition of prisons and what that might entail from utopian and uh, non-utopian anarchist perspectives. So that's the broad outline of the of the series. Uh, the, the outline of the session to, to this evening um, is to, to first consider um, uh, what anarchy as, as order means. And, and to do that, I'm going to start off with a, a small section uh, or a small extract from Proudhon, uh, the granddaddy of anarchism, uh, the first person who um, adopts, the first militant, I suppose, who adopts in a positive sense, uh, the idea of anarchy to describe his political thought. And from his description of, of anarchy, I take two ideas. One is a, is a notion of self-government. So we're going to talk a little bit about self-government and the difference between uh, anarchy and anarchism. Um, and the second idea that he gives us is a, is a critique of sovereignty. And so what I want to do is to, to unpack what the anarchists or some of the ideas that anarchists um, attach critically to the notion of sovereignty by looking first at a, a notion of, of enlightened rule, which anarchists dismiss or, or reject. Um, secondly, at a, an idea of um, the state as the, uh, the origin of justice, which again, anarchists reject. And then at a problem of common good, um, which anarchists might admit, but don't think is, is, is possible uh, through the organization of the state. And to make that argument, I'm going to focus in particular on some of the arguments that are um, presented by Tolstoy, um, Leo Tolstoy, the writer. Um, and uh, to round off, I suppose, this, this part of the, of, the, of the session, I want to, to look at the way in which Tolstoy uh, gives us a critique of sovereign power uh, and then think about what that means for uh, the order of, of the state versus the order of anarchy. So there are five broad sections. So to kick off, um, let's think about uh, Proudhon. So this is a picture of Proudhon. Uh, Proudhon was active in the 1840s in France, um, and he published in 1840 uh, the, the book, What is Property?, which is where he gave, gives the answer, property is theft. Uh, and he also talks about the, the prejudice um, against anarchy as a, as a political idea. And he defines it and he says, anarchy, the absence of a master, of a sovereign, such is the form of government to which we are every day approximating and which are accustomed, which our accustomed habit of taking man for our rule and his will for our law leads us to regard as the height of disorder and the expression of chaos. So there are a number of things going on in this, um, this snippet. One is the idea that, that anarchy is a, is a developmental um, process. Um, and I'm going to touch on that in more detail in session three when we talk about utopianism. And then there are these two other ideas about what anarchy is. Um, and one, it's, it's the rejection of sovereignty and it's a form of government. So anarchy is not the rejection of government, it's the rejection of sovereignty and government. 
It's a form of government and it's a, a critique of sovereignty. And it's because it's a critique of sovereignty or a critique of mastership, the absence of a master, that we tend automatically to think that it is impossible. It is chaotic. And what Proudhon wants to convince us of is that that's a mistake, that anarchy is actually a form of order which contrasts in, in almost every way to the order of government, or to the order of the state that we think is um, inevitable, good and necessary. Um, and Proudhon wants to convince us otherwise. So I'm going to take the two ideas that he gives us here, the idea of sovereignty and what that means, and the idea of government and what that means in order to think about how we might uh, define or approach this order of anarchy in ways which are positive and which don't imply uh, chaos and uh, destruction. So I'm going to start off by thinking about um, government. And I think there are two um, approaches, if you like, in, um, in anarchist writing, uh, to think of, which help us think about government and, and, and what it means in a, in a non-statist uh, context. And the first I'm, I'm calling an anthropological view, um, whereby government is, is distinguished from uh, the order of the state as a principle of self-government. And it simply describes the capacity of human beings to organize their affairs collectively. It's an observable behavior that anthropologists um, observe almost wherever they go. Um, and it describes um, traditions of, of communal practice. Um, it uh, relies on, a, on an understanding that human beings are naturally sociable beings, that is, they live in groups. Uh, and that they have an ordinary capacity uh, to develop their own rules and principles, uh, to build their own institutions, uh, to devise their own practices of decision making, or in other, way, in other words, to, to constitute themselves as communities which have their own dynamics and practices. And in this sense, people are, uh, the argument is that Anarchy is a natural form of, uh, of government. It's something that you observe pretty much in, in any uh, human community. And it suggests that, um, that individuals and groups can arrange themselves and devise their own uh, ways of living without the imposition of or without the aid of, of any external force. So it sets up a, an immediate kind of um, contrast between uh, what exists, what is observable in our ordinary practices, and what we see from, say, uh, the 16th and 17th centuries developing in European uh, territories in particular, uh, which, we, which we identify, these processes of centralization and control, which we identify with the state. The important thing about this view uh, is that although it describes uh, a capacity for anarchy, for anarchist self-government. It's not necessarily a self-conscious uh, movement towards anarchism. Um, and the, the quote that I've got here uh, is from a book about um, uh, African anarchism or anarchism in Africa. Uh, and, the, and the distinction is made between uh, the, the movement, the European movement, which we call anarchism, uh, which describes a certain set of ideals and political principles, and the, the self-governing practices that you can find across the continent of Africa, uh, which are not necessarily politicized through anarchist thought. And, and the, the argument here is anarchy as an abstraction may be remote to Africans, but it is not unknown as a way of life. So what the, what the authors are trying to suggest to us is that before the Europeans uh, colonized the continent, actually anarchy was, was, uh, was the norm. Um, in, in local communities, uh, in African communities. Um, but that doesn't make the, the, the organization, the forms of those, uh, those communities necessarily something that anarchists would identify with anarchism. So there's a distinction between this kind of anarchy and the, the, the politics of anarchism that develops in Europe in the, in the 19th century. So to think about this in, um, in, uh, another way, in a more formal way, there's an argument, a, a very um, 
uh, strong argument or a very sort of um, familiar argument, I guess, in, in anarchism about self-government, which thinks about um, the capacity, the ordinary capacity to self-organize or to self-govern and formalizes it uh, through an anarchist lens as a principle of mutual aid. And the concept of mutual aid is associated in particular with Peter Kropotkin, who was a 19th century writer. He was born in 1842. He died in 1921. So last year was the centenary of his, of his death. And in 1902, he published a book called Mutual Aid, uh, in which he distinguishes or in which he discusses um, or describes a principle um, which is both an organizational principle and an ethical principle. And the argument of mutual aid uh, is that um, the capacity to cooperate is a capacity that human beings share with all um, animal species. Um, it's a capacity which um, can be described, if you like, in Darwinian terms as, a, as an indicator of fitness. So um, the extent to which uh, any species can organise its affairs collectively uh, is an indication of how successful it's going to be in the long term in terms of its survival. If you can't organise collectively, then Kropotkin's argument is that you're likely to die out because you don't have the uh, the mechanisms to, to protect yourselves. Kropotkin's other argument is that the, uh, the extent to which you can devise institutions which enable cooperation and enable collective uh, endeavours um, provides a basis for an ethical reflection or a moral development uh, of solidarity or mutual support and help. Um, and his, his idea is that all human um, forms of, of organization exhibit this kind of ethics, this conscious uh, decision to, to act in ways which are solidaristic and mutually uh, supportive. Um, and we can identify uh, a sort of uh, different models, if you like, in which uh, mutual aid is practiced. So he calls these models tribal society, village community, city, state and commune. And he says the difference between these different models of society is not that, that one is superior to the other, uh, but that, that the practice of mutual aid becomes more extensive uh, in some forms of organization compared to others. So his argument is that in tribal societies, we have you tend to observe mutual aid being practiced amongst those members of the tribe, uh, whereas in village communities and city states and so on, uh, you'll have mutual aid being practiced not only to members of particular members of groups, but also to strangers. And the more extensively we can, we can practice mutual aid, uh, the healthier our species is. Uh, and the, um, the the greater well-being that we can we can enjoy. So this is an idea of self-government, which has a kind of an anthropological feel to it. It also has a, a, a an appeal to science, to, to biology in it. But it basically tries to formalise a capacity for self-government to give it a, a, a self-conscious, a deliberate anarchist twist. And to say that actually, you know, if we can learn not only to cooperate and organize our affairs in ways that help each other, uh, we can also build institutions in particular ways. Uh, we can develop particular practices which are egalitarian, uh, which are libertarian, uh, and which enable us to, uh, to, as individuals, to fulfill ourselves uh, to, to, the, to the utmost of our potential. Okay, so there's an idea of self two ideas of self-government. One is a uh, just it just describes an ordinary capability to to constitutionalize, and the second sort of takes this idea of of, of self-constitutionalizing societies and says we can make them anarchist in particular ways. We can politicize them. We can anarchize them. So that's all I wanted to say about self-government, and, and and I suppose the the point really is to to underline the anarchist argument that, that anarchy is not absurd. Anarchy is actually something that you can see. It's something that you, we can, um, you know, if we take it out of political theory, then it's something that we can accept as being a possibility. The problem that the anarchist has and the problem that Proudhon points up uh, is that somehow we detach ourselves from this reality of self-government and we consider it to be absurd because we've become used, we've become used to 
uh, certain forms of hierarchy, certain arrangements of political power, which um, make everything else seem somehow unreasonable to us or uncivilized or somehow primitive or uh, not suitable for, um, for modern complex societies. And the heart of this idea, it comes from political theory, and it's the idea of sovereignty. And it's this that, that Proudhon thinks is the, this acceptance of sovereignty is the, uh, the, the principal stumbling block uh, to thinking about anarchy as an order, as opposed to a condition of chaos. So in what remains of, of the, the session tonight, I want to sort of think about two questions. The first one is what does the rejection of sovereignty entail? What is it that anarchists are attacking when they're attacking sovereignty, uh, which makes their ideas seem to be so preposterous, uh, wrongly in my view? And the, and the second question is how does the rejection of the sovereign order help us think about the order of anarchy in terms of a kind of a, um, a theoretical arrangement in terms of a, um, a, th uh, a political choice. So they're the two questions I'm going to, to ask. To, to think about the first question, I've got a series of um, ideas of sovereignty or three ideas of sovereignty. Um, and I'm going to, to, to introduce the kind of the mainstream political uh, theory, uh, the de defense of sovereignty, and then look at the anarchist reply. Um, and then once we get to the third idea, which is common good, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the arrangements of power that, that anarchists um, associate with sovereignty um, and which form the basis, the backdrop, if you like, for the, for the concept of, of, of state abolition. So um, apologies for the sort of the size of, the, of this uh, of the script. I'm going to read this um, and, and explain it as I go through before thinking about the anarchist response. But the first idea of sovereignty I want to think about um, is the idea of enlightened rule. Um, and this is an idea that's deeply embedded in mainstream political theory. It comes from um, classical Greek thought, uh, in particular, the ideas of Plato. And it's expressed here uh, in the, um, the, the analogy of the, of the, of the ship of state. Um, and this, it's a very famous extract uh, from the Republic um, where Plato describes a, a mutiny on a ship in order to defend um, a principle of the, 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 the idea of the philosopher king, basically. So I'm gonna go through the quote um, and then um, think about how the anarchists uh, respond to it or have responded to it. So Plato says to us, imagine then a ship or a fleet in which there is a captain who is taller and stronger than any of the crew but who is a little dead in sight and whose knowledge of navigation is not much better. The sailors are quarreling with one another about the steering. Everyone is of the opinion that he has the right to steer, though he has never learned the art of navigation. The sailors and the, the sailors in, uh, I mean, the, the, the standard interpretation of this, uh, of this extract is the sailors are the demos. These are the people, the mob. The sailors throng about the captain begging and praying him to commit the helm to them. And if at any time they do not prevail, but others are preferred to them, they kill the others or throw them overboard. And having first chained up the noble captain's senses with drink or some no narcotic drug, they mutiny and take possession of the ship and make free with the stores, thus eating and drinking. So this is a story about uh, the... Um, the incapacity of people to uh, to sensibly make decisions for themselves, and the, the 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 problem of democracy being a problem of uh, of 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 competition uh, and uh, uninformed um, yeah chaos, I suppose. So it goes on. They proceed on their voyage in such a manner as can be expected of him of of them. Him who is their partisan and cleverly aids them in their plots for getting the ship out of the captain's hands into their own, whether by force or persuasion, they complement with the name of the sailor, pilot, able seaman. So this person uh, who then takes control is the equivalent of the, of the demagogue uh, or the orator or what we might call in today's uh, language, the, the, the populist. 
they compliment him with the name of sailor pilot able seaman and abuse the other sort of man whom they call a good for nothing but that the good pilot must pay attention to the year and seasons and sky and, and stars and winds and whatever else belongs to his art if he intends to be really qualified for the command of the ship and that he must and will be the steerer whether other people like it or not the possibility of this union of authority with the steerer's art has never seriously entered into their thoughts or been made part of their calling. So the argument that, that's being presented here is that if you allow people uh, to, to take charge of their own affairs, then at best you can only hope that they're going to be misled uh, by someone who presents themselves as being qualified uh, to lead them, but who is not qualified, but who who just appeals to their um, their prejudices, if you like. Um, and what you'll overlook is the capacity for enlightened rule, um, which can only be delivered by someone who has not only um, practical skill, um, political skill, but also philosophical or intellectual insight and vision. And this is the defence, if you like, of leadership of a sovereign um, against uh, a, a democratic or a uh, certainly an anarchy. I mean, for for Plato, democracy falls into anarchy. It's the it's the critique of that kind of chaos uh, that this that this uh, extract I think really exemplifies. So, and and I think you know the, the you know the point I suppose is that we tend to think when we think of sovereigns, when we think of masters, when we think of our leaders, we tend to think that they are better than us in some way. And what the anarchist wants to say is that that actually that puts things on their head. That's a complete mistake. So the reverse of this uh, of this idea of of, of sovereignty. Um, is that, you know, from the anarchist point of view, this claim to enlightened rule is simply a, um, a form of hubris. Um, and what I've got here, um, I mean, I've chosen this quote because it, it I mean, I, I don't know whether um, Tolstoy had Plato in mind, but it, but it seems uh, to, um, to mirror very nicely the, the kind of the ship of state analogy that, that Plato gives us. And it comes from War and Peace. Um, and it comes um, at a point in War and Peace, it comes at a, a description of, of um, uh, the French approach to Moscow in 1812. And I'm going to have to say a bit more about that in a, in a couple more slides. And it's, it's a comment that's made about a particular leader um, but it's a, a comment that runs, or it's a, an idea that runs throughout War and Peace, uh, which is this idea of leadership as a, as a con. Uh, and one of, the, one of the arguments that Tolstoy wants to make in War and Peace, particularly about Napoleon, uh, is that you know, the problem of leaders is that they tend to believe in their own propaganda. They tend to think of themselves as these, as these great experts who can, who can bring fundamental change and improve people's lives. Um, but in fact, they're, they're just, they're just deluded, um, because the only change that, that can, or the, the, the way that, that, that societies change, um, is actually a result of, of, of small actions of, of, of multiple people. Uh, you know, so one of the arguments that Tolstoy wants to make in War and Peace is that, you know, how do you explain war? It's, it's thousands and thousands of people deciding that they're going to fight. That's the explanation for war. It's not the commander. That's the, the commander does not control events. And so Tolstoy says, um, in quiet and untroubled times, it seems to every administrator, or we could say leader, that, he's, that it is only by his efforts that the whole population under his rule is kept going. And in this consciousness of being indispensable, every administrator finds the chief reward of his labor and efforts. So it's, it's the, um, because the administrator thinks of himself or the leader thinks of himself as indis indispensable, uh, he feels good about his, his, his life. While the sea of history remains calm, so when nothing much is going on, the ruler administrator in his frail bark, holding on with a boat hook to the ship of the people and himself moving, naturally imagines that his efforts move the ship he is holding onto. So when um, 
in ordinary times when there's you know when there's uh, no sense of of disruption when when things are just sort of carrying on without interruption uh, the administrator thinks that it's because that he is there that we have this this apparent peace but he's wrong and Tolstoy continues, as soon as the storm arises and the sea begins to heave and the ship to move, such a delusion is no longer possible. The ship moves independently with its own enormous motion. The boat hook no longer reaches the moving vessel. And suddenly the administrator, instead of appearing a ruler and a source of power, becomes an insignificant, useless, feeble man. So the argument is that we can see the weakness of leadership, the flaws of leadership. We can see the kind of the hubris that's attached to the sovereign at moments of crisis. And it's at those moments when we see the inability of the sovereign to, to deliver on the promises, to, to look after us, to protect us, to ensure our security, to make us happy, whatever the promises happen to be. We can see these as being fundamentally um, undeliverable. Um, so, you know, what happens when there's a, a major uh, flood or um, natural disaster? Uh, actually, people have, to, have to, to generally fend for themselves because the sovereign can do nothing about it. The resources are never really there. Uh, it's the people themselves who make the difference. That's Tolstoy's argument, and it's a very familiar argument within anarchist thought. Uh, the idea of enlightened rule is simply a delusion. So the second uh, defense of sovereignty, which anarchists take issue with, is the idea that without a sovereign, there can be no justice. Um, what you have um, in, with the absence of sovereignty uh, is simply arbitrary, um, the arbitrary rule of the strongest. And the person who makes this argument uh, most forcefully in the history of, of mainstream political thinking uh, is Thomas Hobbes, uh, who was an English writer, active um, in the 17th century, he publishes on his most famous book, Leviathan, is published in 1651. And it's a response to the, um, to the English Civil War and an attempt to, um, to justify uh, a principle of absolute rule um, as a way of ensuring social peace. Um, and in order to do this, um, Hobbes sets up um, a hypothetical um, situation, which he calls the state of nature in which he imagines the ways in which people would behave if they did not have um, a ruler to determine their affairs. And there are a number of assumptions that, that Hobbes makes in about the state of nature. Uh, one, he assumes that, that individuals are, are not naturally sociable. So, uh, you know, anarchists immediately take issue with that. So he thinks about individuals as, as separate sort of atomized beings. Uh, he thinks of those beings as roughly equal in the sense that no one of them can, can dominate the rest. So there's no natural leader. Um, he says that they have um, the rights to all things. Uh, he says that each of us, uh, one of the only things that we share in common is a, a lust for power uh, that, that ceaseth only in death. So we're, we're, uh, we're all beings who are driven by power uh, in order to secure uh, everything that we can, everything that we want, um, and secure our liberty. And the other thing that, that he says um, is that there's there's no uh, shared sense of right or wrong. So there's no common moral feeling between these individuals. Um, individuals call good the things that they like. They call bad the things that they don't like. And they don't necessarily share the same tastes for good, good or bad. Therefore, they disagree. There's no moral um, community. So he says, in this condition, uh, the only way that you can have a just society is for everybody to give up their right to everything and to subordinate themselves to a sovereign who will provide order. And through that order, ensure that there is something that we can call justice because the, 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 the sovereign the Leviathan, uh, is the person who will um, enforce moral codes. So we'll know for certain what's right and what's wrong. And on that basis, we can, we can decide, we can determine uh, what's just and what's unjust. So um, Hobbes says, justice and propriety begin with the constitution of commonwealth. Before the names of just and unjust can have place, there must be some coercive power 
to compel men equally to the performance of their covenants, their promises, by the terror of some punishment greater than the benefit they expect by the breach of their covenant. covenant. So the only reason that people will, will, will keep, um, keep their promises and uh, keep to their contracts um, and live lives which can be regarded as being just is because they're too frightened to do otherwise. Uh, they're going to be compelled to do it. And that's what sovereign power gives you. And then he says again, where there is no commonwealth, there is nothing unjust. So that nature of justice consisteth in keeping valid covenants, but the validity of covenants begins not with the constitution of a civil power, sufficient begins not but with, i.e. except uh, the constitution of a civil power, sufficient to compel men to keep them. And then it is also that propriety begins. So before you have sovereignty, you have not only um, the absence of any kind of uh, social life, uh, you have the absence of, of, of any kind of concept of justice. So the benefit of sovereignty is that it gives us this kind of this moral compass, if you like. So how does the anarchist uh, respond to that? Um, well, not well is the answer. And one of the people who spends some time thinking about Hobbes is Proudhon. Um, and he does so um, in his version, in his book, also called War and Peace, uh, which he talked to Tolstoy about before Tolstoy published his novel um, in 1861. And he thinks about one of the things that is a huge book, and, and one of the one of the things that uh, that Proudhon wants to think about is this idea of, of of where justice comes from and how it is we can associate uh, moral principles uh, with orders that are um, that are stateless that have no sovereign. And what he tells us is that uh, the, the the problem uh, that or one of the things that that Hobbes overlooks is the capacity for religious thinking. Um, and his, his argument in this extract, which I'll read in a second, is that Hobbes tends to think of religion as something that comes from, from institutions that are imposed you know, from, 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 from clerics, from priests, from, from hierarchies. And one of the things that Proudhon has to say is that actually what you find when you look at the ways in which people live is that they, have, they generate their own religious beliefs too. And that, that, that sense of religion gives gives people a sense of morality. Uh, that morality is never fixed. Um, it can change over time. And it's the, that religious uh, intuition, if you like, which gives people a sense of justice, a sense of right and wrong, which enables them to regulate their affairs in principled ways. And that's what underpins anarchy. That's one of the things that we can, uh, we can develop as anarchists, if you like, in order to put, to uh, improve our, 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 our stateless relationships. So he says, Hobbes was wrong in the first place about religion in which he saw either an institution from on high or an invention of the priests and which today regard as symbolic or primitive form of society and of justice. He was wrong about the nature of society which he deemed the outcome of mere necessity and calculated interest, whereas it is also the product of a specific faculty of our soul which pushes us toward it even as our irascible appetite pushes us to war. Finally, he was wrong in his definition of right, which he describes in absolute terms as the faculty which man possesses to do everything, making no distinction between good or bad for the purpose of preserving his body and his limbs, what we look upon as respect for the dignity of men in our own person and in the person of each of our fellows, a respect that is deep down nothing more than the respect religion inculcates in us in the name of heavenly powers and the effect of which upon our will is to render us subject to society and force us to abide by its laws. So Proudhon is telling us uh, that not only are we naturally sociable beings, i.e. we live in groups, uh, we don't live as isolated individuals, uh, but the, uh, the norms and practices we develop, we consider to be binding. Uh, that doesn't mean they can't be challenged and they can't be changed. They clearly are over time, and we can see that in history. Um, but what he's saying is that they are self-regulating and they're moral societies. They have a, a clear sense of right and wrong. So you do not need a sovereign to tell you what is what is just and unjust and to compel you to obey. Uh, this sense of, of moral uh, being 
comes from from our self organization, from our principles of self, from our, our ordinary capacity for self government. Okay, um, so the last aspect of of, of sovereignty, um, which I want to think about um, in terms of of the anarchist critique, um, is the idea that um, sovereignty can be associated with uh, common good. Uh, that that whatever else uh, can be said about uh, compelling people to obey, uh, there's another way of looking at, at sovereign power. And, and that's the way that, that, that Rousseau, who's pictured here, thinks about it, which is that the, the sovereign is a way in which uh, individuals constitute themselves as a collective force uh, and through which they express their, uh, what he calls their general will, in order to um, to provide a you know a, a, a home, if you like, for for citizens and to to give them a a, a a common purpose. So Rousseau's idea um, is to empower individuals as citizens and to 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 bring them into a relationship with each other, which is um, just and fair and broadly egalitarian. Um, and and also from from Rousseau's point of view, which gives them um, gives them freedom too. So he describes the sovereign as something that's formed wholly of individuals who compose it. So this is not imposed on you. This is something that you take part in, that you participate in. Neither has nor can have any interest contrary to theirs. So because you are participant in creating the sovereign in being part of this common endeavor, it's, it can't oppress you because you're part, participant to it. Consequently, the sovereign power need give no guarantee to its subjects because it is impossible for the body to wish to hurt all its members. We shall also see later on that it cannot hurt any in particular. The sovereign merely by virtue of what it is, is always what it should be. So this is a very benign view of, of sovereign power, which, which um, derives its, its value, if you like, its political value from the fact that it is inclusive. It involves everybody in its construction. So why are anarchists opposed to this? Well, there are, I mean, there are lots of different uh, types of objection to this idea of, of sovereignty as, as the common good. But the one I want to focus on is the, is the argument that Tolstoy gives us. Um, and Tolstoy's argument is not about the principle of the common good as such. It's about its enactment. And, and Tolstoy's argument is that um, when it comes to making decisions on behalf of the sovereign, uh, sovereignty necessarily involves a separation of the rulers from the rules. Uh, because, because of the nature of the sovereign itself, because we are all participant in it, we can't all make decisions every, uh, you know, on everything. We therefore have to delegate our sovereign power to a, to a decision maker uh, or to a body of decision makers. And in doing that, Tolstoy tells us that we, uh, necessarily construct a hierarchy. Um, the rule is at the top and the rule is at the bottom, but this is a hierarchy which is also uh, structured by power. So those at the top make the decisions, that is, they, 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 they have power concentrated in their hands, but the decisions they make are not decisions that directly affect them. They're decisions for which they make everybody else responsible because everybody else is is part of the sovereign, is considered to be participant, even if they're not uh, decision makers themselves. So Tolstoy says, power is the relation of a given person to other individuals in which the more this person expresses opinions, predictions, and justifications of the collective action that is performed, the less his participation in that action. So those who decide actually tend not to act uh, and also uh, will give responsibility for the decision to those who have to act because they're compelled to do so. So those taking the largest direct share in the event take on themselves the least responsibility and vice versa. So there's, there's an inverse relationship between power and responsibility. Those at the top have no responsibility or wash their hands of responsibility. Those at the bottom have no power and ultimately carry the can for anything that's decided on their behalf. Now, to illustrate this, 
Um, I've got a, um, a section here from, from War and Peace, uh, which describes the trial and um, execution uh, of a man called Vereshagin. And it comes just at the point where uh, the French are about to uh, enter into Moscow. Um, and the, the entry into Moscow is presented by Tolstoy as a, um, a particular humiliation for the governor of Mos Moscow, a guy called Rostopchin, who had previously promised to defend Moscow to the last uh, and to resist the French, uh, and then who finds himself in a position where um, pretty much, you know, Moscow has, has, has been left defenceless. Um, and he is looking um, rather stupid and powerless. Uh, and at the moment of crisis, his delusion of power, if you like, has been revealed. So in order to um, deflect attention from his own weakness, he presents in front of the, you know, the remaining sort of people of Moscow, the Moscovites, um, a traitor or someone who he accuses of treachery um, in order that the, that they can take their vengeance, if you like, against this, this, against Vereshagin and, um, and be distracted from the, the, the real predicament that they face, which is that they've been less, left defenceless by someone who's, who's promised to, to um, ensure their security. Um, and it's a pretty um, gruesome um, section, um, but I think it's worth, uh, worth reading. Um, and this is, this is the quote from, from War and Peace. And he says, uh, this is Ross Stockton uh, talking here to, to the crowd. He says, this man, Vereshagin, Betrayed his Tsar and his country, he has caused Moscow to perish, says Rostopchin. Deal with him as you think fit. I hand him over to you. Uh, and not by accident, I think. Uh, the, the scene evokes uh, the trial of Jesus by Pilate. Uh, the difference between uh, the biblical story and, and Tolstoy's story is that whereas it's the mob who demand the killing of, of Jesus, uh, in this case, the, the the crowd are refusing to to respond to the call uh, to to deal with the traitor. Uh, so Tolstoy tells us the crowd remains silent and only press closer and closer to one another. Beat him! Let the traitor perish and not disgrace the Russian name! Shouted Rostopchin. Cut him down! I command it. The crowd moaned and heaved forward, but again paused, so they don't want to do it. Cut him down, I command it, shouted Rostopchin, suddenly growing pale like Vereshagin. And one of the soldiers struck Vereshagin on the head with the blunt side of his sabre. Ah, cried Vereshagin in meek surprise, and that cry was fatal. The barrier of human feeling, strained to the utmost, that had held the crowd in check, suddenly broke. The crime had begun and must now be completed. Some beat and tore at Vereshagin. And for a long time, those who were hitting, throttling and tearing at Vereshagin were unable to kill him. At the moment when Vereshagin fell and the crowd closed with savage yells and swayed about him, Rostopin, Rostopchin suddenly turned pale. When he could no longer hear the shouts of the mob, the count began to repent. The mob is terrible, disgusting. They are like wolves whom nothing but flesh can appease. But this was only a momentary feeling and Count Rostopchin smiled disdainfully at himself. I had other duties, thought he, and he began thinking of his social duties to his family and to the city entrusted to him and of himself as governor, the representative of, of authority and of the Tsar. So the story encapsulates, if you like, the theory of power that, that Tolstoy wants to give us in critique of this idea of, of common good, which is namely that uh, the attempt to enact what is good for everybody simply ends up uh, with those in charge commanding the most evil and abhorrent deeds and washing their hands of responsibility for it, whereas it's the rest of us uh, who actually uh, pick up the pieces uh, of the actions that they command. So um, I'm coming to the end now, and I, uh, you know, what I've done so far is, is one, try and think about government and self-government and, and secondly try and think about this concept of sovereignty and how it is that that anarchists unpack it so i asked two questions at the beginning of this and the first one was well what does the rejection of sovereignty entail um, and we tend to, to sort of 
um, or anarchists uh, tend to, to be associated with the idea of abolition. And I think, you know, I, I hope at least that by thinking about um, self-government and, and sovereignty, we can we can start to, to think you know, a, a bit more subtly about what what abolition means. And and, and again, I'm, I'm drawing on Tolstoy to, to do this. I mean, for, for Tolstoy, um, overcoming or, or transforming the state means um, addressing its pathologies, uh, the ways in which it makes us um, sick. Uh, and he, there are three, I mean, uh, yeah, I think three core ideas that he gives us uh, to help think about this. And the first one is, is what he calls hypnosis. Uh, so this is the, uh, the tendency of, uh, of sovereigns uh, to um, seduce us into thinking uh, that we have to uh, abide by the hierarchies and the the commands and the the systems of authority uh, that they put in place. We're hypnotised by these things, and we have to withdraw. We have to 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 wake ourselves up and realise that actually, you know, what this what this results in is is uh, our responsibility for the most heinous kinds of acts uh, that that actually we become these aggressive com sort of uh, uh, competitive individuals uh, that the state is claiming uh, to to make us you know to to, um, to 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 make us not be uh, it's precisely the state that hip hypnotizes us into thinking that that it's necessary when it's not the second thing we have to overcome uh, if we're thinking about uh, the sovereignty of the state is is the intimidation that, that the state lays at our our, our door every day. Uh, so uh, the 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 compulsion, the force uh, that's used, and and so to give you some examples, I mean Tolstoy says, you know, um, you should resist conscription. Uh, you should resist those sorts of commands where your moral judgment, uh, which is you know, uh, not innate, but something that you know that you can put yourself in touch with uh, tells you that this is wrong. You have to resist. Uh, and that might be difficult. It might be very, very difficult, but you have to try. Uh, and the third thing that abolition entails is, is simply uh, identifying and, uh, again, kind of resisting the habits that, that statism breeds in us. Um, and he says those habits... Um, are fundamentally structured by law. Um, and we can, you know, just as we, we tend to follow these rules and regulations without much reflection, we can also resist them through our reflection um, and, uh, and uh, self-awareness, if you like. So abolition is not necessarily, um, you know, putting up barricades and attacking institutions. It's thinking about the ways in which the institutions themselves uh, structure our behaviours and um, discourage us from thinking about our independent judgments. So this is a, it's a, a call, I think, a fundamental call uh, for us to uh, not give up on sovereignty, but to claim sovereignty for ourselves. Each of us individually is sovereign. It's not something that we can delegate to somebody else. Uh, it's only something that we can exercise collectively uh, through our cooperation with other people. Uh, if we give it up to somebody else and say that somebody else has to make all the decisions for us, then we're going to end up in this kind of pathological mess. So the second question was, how does the rejection of, of sovereignty help frame uh, the idea of order and anarchy? Um, and to try and illustrate this, um, there's a rather sort of uh, <laughs> complicated diagram. I've, I've, what I've tried to do here is, is depict um, an argument that's made by Martin Buber in an essay called Society and the State. At the top of the um, of the session today, uh, Ross mentioned the, the the late great Colin Ward, who wrote Anarchy in Action, um, and Colin Ward was someone who um, much admired Martin Buber, and particularly this essay, Society and the State. Uh, and in the essay, um, Buber identifies two um, 
contrasting or a pair of contrasting principles. They don't map onto each other exactly, but they tend to parallel each other in practice. So the first pairing is what he calls the political principle and the social principle. And he defines the political principle as a principle of subordination, which he associates with concentrations of power, um, with uh, domination, with hierarchy, authority, uh, with all of the, the kinds of institutional arrangements that we associate with, with statism. And against that, he says, there's another principle which tends to get lost in mainstream political thinking, um, but which sociologists um, tend to be quite sensitive to, and that's the social principle. And this is, if you like, the principle of, of association that anarchists associate with link to, to self-government, the ordinary capacity to, to organise your own affairs cooperatively with other people. This is the social principle. And those principles are, um, uh, they don't exist in isolation. So, so Buber argues that um, even where you have very uh, structured forms or very uh, hierarchical forms of power and where you have very definite forms of, of domination, there are still social principles that are active. And that's also the kind of argument that Colin Ward is making in Anarchy in Action. So even in the state, you can find practices of mutual aid. Uh, this, this never goes away, but it's something that you know, we could rebalance, if you like, um, and prioritise the social principle and reduce the political principle so that we have different ways of social, so that we associate in ways that reduce the, the, the reliance on domination. Okay, the other two, um, the other pairing is the state and society. Um, and these are forms of organisation. So this is a kind of a, a nod, if you like, I suppose, to, to people like um, Kropotkin and the idea of mutual aid. And he says, um, these are organizational forms which um, he, he calls communities of habit, custom and conflict. So um, the, what he's trying to argue is that society is not um, a condition of peace compared to a state which is a condition of war. He's saying both are conditions of, um, of, of, of diverse relationships which are, are more or less conflictual, um, but where the tendency of the state is to, to resolve differences between people, between groups, by imposing uniformity, by ensuring regulation through the force of law, uh, backed by, by actual physical force. Whereas society, in society, what, what you have um, are self-organized uh, groups who may conflict with each other, um, but who, uh, what, but which practice um, different kinds of, of approaches to, to conflict rev, uh, resolution in order to empower diversity and to recognise difference and to recognise multiplicity. And what Buber wants to argue is that anarchy veers towards the, the principle, the social principle of association uh, and embrace concepts of society. These are, and, th and, and, and in doing this, it doesn't rid itself of politics. It doesn't necessarily have no forms of, of, of regulation or uh, tendencies towards uniformity, but it tries to check those. Uh, so when we're talking about the, when we talk about abolition, what we're talking about is reprioritizing rather than actually destroying something and building something anew. Um, and I think that, um, for me at least, um, that presents a much more, um, practical approach, if you like, to thinking about how we can anarchize our relationships to, a, to, the, to, the, to the naked idea of abolition. Um, so that's where I'm going to leave it tonight. I mean, just to, to look forward to, um, to next week. Um, I mean, I suppose the, the, sort of the key point I've, I've wanted to, to make in this, this idea of, of thinking about anarchy and order is that what we're, if, there, if there was one thing that we were trying to, to abolish as anarchists, it's this idea of, of unitary power, of, of, the, of the, uh, the absolute sovereign who makes decisions on our behalf or um, indeed as, as, as something as for our common good. And what it might mean, um, I think, um, looking at particularly at, at Proudhon and, and Tolstoy, 
uh, but also, I mean, it comes in Kropotkin too. That might mean a recovery of something called religion, though not theology. It might mean, the rec- or it does mean the recovery of responsibility, of, of taking sovereignty back to ourselves rather than delegating it to somebody else. Uh, and it means the embrace of complexity. And what I want to do next week is to think or to begin to think about how those recoveries, how that abolition uh, has been captured uh, in utopian thought. Okay, thank you. Thank you.